Dear friends and colleagues, welcome to BEST for the day, ESMO 2014 in Madrid. It is my great pleasure to be here. My name is Javier Cortés. I am the head of the breast cancer program at Valdebron Institute of Oncology in Barcelona, Spain. So it is difficult sometimes to define which is one of the best, or maybe the best thing we have presented, we have listened to in one of these type of meetings, ESCO, ESMO San Antonio. But I think that digital ESMO, we had great, great data, great abstract, great presentations, but without any doubt, I think that, I think that the data from the Cleopatra trial were absolutely unbelievable. So I think that the dramatic results we just heard is a great, great, mm, I mean, I don't know how to say, it, it's difficult to define, but great opportunity for us as physicians, but also for our patients to face uh, metastatic breast cancer, her to positive disease. So you know, the Cleopatra is a randomized, placebo control phase three trial comparing chemotherapy based on docetaxel with trastuzumab and placebo or trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Although the primary endpoint was progression-free survival, overall survival was secondary a secondary endpoint, but it was power to observe statistically significant differences. The Yeratesmo, we had the very final overall survival data. As you all know, and we published in Lasting Oncology in 2013, Vincent Rosain, the first author, overall survival was improved by 34%. The updated data showed an improvement of 32%, and the median overall survival was moving from 40.8 months to more than 56 months. So it means that we had an improvement of almost 16 months, which is absolutely impressive. So about 50% of our patients with head to positive metastatic breast cancer are going to live approximately five years. And many of these patients, out 30 to 40% of them, will live more than six years or so. So I think that this is absolute, these are absolutely good news for all of us. And also, it's interesting to remark that with this final data analysis, we have not observed more adverse events than what we observed in previous reports. So it highlights that once those attacks is stopped, the toxicity with trastuzumab and pertuzumab is very well known and very, very well tolerated. In my opinion, this is not only a new standard of care, but the new standard of care. And I don't know, but it's difficult to say, but I think that this is maybe the main important data we have had in the history of metastatic breast cancer. So let's see if in the future, immunotherapy can improve the impressive results we had with pertuzumab when combined with trastuzumab. Regarding HER2, we had also interesting data. On the retrospective in nature, we had some, some data about TDM1 in patients with metastatic breast cancer in the brain. It was a very, very low number of patient trial, but it showed that TDM1 might have activity in patients with brain metastasis. Great exciting data came up regarding antigenesis three very interesting and important clinical trials were presented. The first one was the resilience trial. This was a randomized phase three placebo control trial in patients with her to negative metastatic breast cancer. And they were randomized to receive capsaicin with or without sorafenib. Patients who did not receive sorafenib received placebo. Primary endpoint of the trial was not reached. So unfortunately, serafenib did not improve PFS. Toxicity was a little bit higher in the serafenib based arm. I think that this was a little bit unexpected. Based on the great data we observed in the randomized phase two trial published by Joseba Serva and colleagues in Journal of Clinical Oncology. Patients who received in that trial serafenib based therapy achieved an impressive improvement in progression free survival, but toxicity, grade three and four events were 
absolutely high. That's why, in this trial, the resilience, we had to decrease the dose of serafinib, maybe being responsible for not achieving such a great results. On the other hand, we have the trials with bevacizumab, two very interesting trials, the Tanya trial and the Imelda trial. The Tanya trial is a randomized trial in patients who received bevacizumab in first line and had some benefit. And we wanted to demonstrate if we can improve survival, or if we, if we can improve progression free survival, but also overall survival as a secondary endpoint in this group of patients. So patients basically were randomized to receive different approaches with chemotherapy, with bevacizumab, or not, only chemotherapy alone. In patients who received bevacizumab, they were, or they had the opportunity to continue on with bevacizumab in the third line, and patients who did not receive bevacizumab, did not receive bevacizumab in third line. So secondary in points of the trial, we need to address if progression free survival after second and third line were also improved with bevacizumab, and if we could observe something in terms of overall survival. The primary analysis of this trial was achieved. Patients who received bevacizumab-based therapy after bevacizumab improved progression-free survival. The hazard ratio was about 0.75. So again, this is the, fourth, the fifth trial we had the ECOG2100, the ABADO trial, and the RIBON1 trial, in which we observed an improvement in primary progression free survival data. We had also the RIBON2, demonstrated that in second line, bevacizumab improves outcomes. So today we know that in patients who receive bevacizumab in first line, continuing bevacizumab in second line could be a good strategy for a subgroup of patients. But in my opinion, the great, great results from antiangiogenesis came from the Imelda trial. This trial was presented as an oral presentation by Joseph Gligarov from Paris. And they wanted to demonstrate if in patients who received docetaxel plus bevacizumab and had a clinical benefit rate, they were not progressing, we could maintain bevacizumab alone or we might improve outcomes when we continue with bevacizumab but in combination with capsaicin. So basically, the design was simple. Patients who were up to six months with docetaxel plus bevacizumab were randomized to cap beva or beva alone. The results were absolutely unexpected. We observed an improvement in median overall survival but about, by about 10 months. So these data, in my opinion, are, are exciting. Of course, we can discuss that maybe the sequential use of good chemo strategies, those that are followed by capsaicin, could be the reason why we observed impressive results in terms of overall survival, and th this could be a, a, good, a, a good reason for that. But in my opinion, also, if, if we take into account that those taxel plus bevacizumab did not improve survival, and with this strategy we did, it might say that maybe if we optimize the way we give bevacizumab-based therapy, we might have advantages in terms of overall survival. So I think that this opened a new window of opportunity for all of us if we want to use bevacizumab. I think that this sequential approach will be very well taken by the physicians and by the patients. So one other very interesting approach was the clinical study done by Fabrice André and colleagues, also from France. They wanted to determine differences between the primary and the metastatic sites. And one of the most impressive results were that in patients with, metasta with metastasis, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes was much less important than in patients with primary tumor. Many of these metastases did have less than 5%. So I think it was very interesting in terms of designing new clinical trials with immunotherapy. You know, all these CTLA-4 inhibitors like ipilimumab or tremelimumab, the anti-PD-1, anti-PDL-1 inhibitors, I think that these trials should be done in breast cancer, should be done in trupenary breast cancer, also in HER2-positive breast cancer. The B consortium is going to launch a large uh, 
face to trial with anti PD1 in patients with, with HER2 positive disease, but also in triple negative disease is a great, great interest. So I think that the very next future, we will see nice results with all these agents. But even much more interesting than that, they also observed that in the metastatic sites, when they took a biopsy for them, we observed many different mechanisms of resistance to different therapies. For example, it was very interesting to observe that in 21% of patients, they had a mutation in the estrogen receptor gene. So maybe it might explain why some patients develop resistance in the when they become metastatic, metastatic. We knew from previous data that these mutations are very, very unusual in the primary tumors. And it was reported 0% in primary tumors versus now about 20, 21% in patients with metastasis. So I think that we have had many other interesting issues, but if I, have, if I would have to review in 15 minutes, the most important advantages we get this year at ESMO, I would say the Cleopatra data first, which again, this is the new standard of care. I think it's difficult to imagine to treat a patient with this HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer in first line without the use of pertuzumab, trastuzumab, and chemotherapy today. I think that we got also interesting data regarding antiangiogenesis. Unfortunately, sorafenib is not going to be there. Sunitinib was also be uh, uh, studied in this patient population, and we know all the results. Sunitinib was not improved anything in breast cancer. And bevacizumab is there. It's available in Europe. It's available in many other countries. I think that now we have a very good opportunity maybe to continue on, tra on, on, a, on bevacizumab for some patients. But of course, we might optimize the way we administer bevacizumab if we combine with um, an optimal schedule of chemotherapy. And finally, and I think that this is a great effort by Fabrice Andrea and colleagues to get biopsies from the metastatic sites for research purposes. Maybe what we were doing in the past, treating patients based on the characteristics of the primary tumor should not be the ideal way to do research in the very next future. Because we are observing that we are having mechanisms of resistance in the, pri in the, in the metastatic sites that were not existing in the primary tumors. So it might deal why some of the recent data about biomarkers, I'm talking about, for example, the Boreo 2, I'm talking about, for example, the Cleopatra. So maybe these old clinical trials fail to demonstrate anything in biomarkers, not because biomarkers do not exist, but maybe because we chose the wrong sample. So again, I think that it was exciting. Just a very little time, we will go to San Antonio. We expect really interesting data also there. And let's, go, let's continue to move forward. Let's continue to invest our money, in, invest the society, or put the society into the clinical trials. This is a great opportunity for us. This is a great opportunity for, for, for society. And we hope to see this disease, the metastatic breast cancer, as a chronic disease. This is our most important objective. I think that we are getting there. So thank you so much for being here today with me, with us. And I really hope to see you next time also in Best of the Day. Thank you.